Hi everyone, it's RJ from Emerald City Hockey with the final edition of our projected Seattle Kraken roster before the expansion draft. The expansion draft is only 11 days away, and as much fun as I've had making this projected Kraken roster, I cannot wait to see who ends up on the real Kraken roster. This video will be our projections for the Kraken in the expansion draft. If you want to know what the expansion draft is and how it works, check out our expansion draft explained video, which is linked in the description below. Now, before I get started, I want to thank you all again for the incredible response to these projected roster videos. Tens of thousands of views, hundreds of comments, and lots of people checking in every day on the website. It's been amazing to see how much interest you've taken in this project, and I really do appreciate it so much. I love hearing all your takes on the roster, I love getting new insight from fans on each team's expansion situation, and most of all, I love going through that comment section every day. Dylan and I do read every single comment that we get, so keep giving us your takes, your feedback, your opinions, we love to hear it. Now, one more note before I get into the roster. There's going to be a lot of pre-expansion draft shuffling from the other 30 participating teams over the next 11 days. In fact, it's already started as I've been recording this video with the Victor Arvidsson trade. But that's the great part about our projected Kraken roster. As moves are made, as things change, the roster changes with it. I've been updating this roster and will continue to update it live on emeraldcityhockey.com right up until the expansion draft, so you can always find our best, most up-to-date prediction for what the Kraken are going to look like. So in the coming days, if you see teams making trades and wonder how that's going to affect the Kraken, check in on the website or our social media and we'll tell you exactly what that means for this projected roster. So without further ado, let's dive in. And as usual, we'll start with the team facts section. And looking at the team as a whole, we're really encountering a major shift in what this roster is going to be. Given how Ron Francis has operated and spoken about the expansion draft so far, we've kind of reached an inflection point where we need to look at this not so much as a final roster, but as a collection of assets, because that's how Ron Francis is looking at it. He knows that these 30 picks aren't going to be what the finished product is in October. Trades will have to be made to move out surplus players in positions of strength like defense and goalie, and bolster positions of weakness like center. So when we look at the positional breakdown, we're sticking with the same 17 forwards, 10 defensemen, 3 goalie setup that we've had for a little while now, which is a bit more forward heavy than what Vegas did in 2017. And I keep coming back to this setup because it just seems like the perfect sweet spot where you have some defensemen you can flip after the expansion draft, but not so many where you oversaturate the market like Vegas did and end up having to settle for lower returns. Onto the salary cap, we have a cumulative cap hit of just a shade under $56 million, which is much cheaper than any previous iteration of this roster. And that is the key to making the end product on the ice the very best it can be. In the current flat cap environment, cap space is the most important asset you can have, and Ron Francis has indicated that he's determined to have as much of it as possible to get the full benefit of any trades or free agent signings that might come along. So in this roster, I prioritized cap space and cap flexibility. Not only do we have a ton of cap room to work with this season, but only one player on the entire roster is signed more than two years out. That's going to provide Ron Francis with a ton of options to weaponize all that cap space. Next, we have the team averages. Average age is 25.6, which would be the youngest team in the NHL. Average height, 6 foot 1 and a half, that's 5th tallest and average weight of 200.2 pounds, which would be the 10th heaviest. So we have a very young team, which fits with what the Kraken have in mind with Dave Haxtall as their coach. Haxtall stressed an emphasis on player development multiple times in his press conference, and he and Ron Francis mentioned the term sustainable success, which comes from developing a young roster like the one we have here. And finally, by country, we have 19 Canadians, three Americans, three Czechs, two Russians, two Swedes, and a Finn. Now onto the roster itself, and we'll start with the forwards. I won't sugarcoat it. This is a young forward group. 
It is an unproven group, and it needs a lot of help down the middle. But the depth players here are among the best in the NHL and could win just about any bottom six matchups. Reinforcements are of course needed in the top six, but Ron Francis will have more than enough cap room and assets stockpiled to supplement it with some help in the form of a Sam Reinhardt, Johnny Gaudreau, or maybe even Jack Eichel. Now, we'll start off the forwards with our pick from the back-to-back Stanley Cup champion Tampa Bay Lightning, and that is Yanni Gord. At 29 years old, he's the oldest forward on this roster, which highlights how young of a forward group this is. As you would expect, the Lightning are pretty stacked, which means they have a number of enticing options both at forward and defense. Matthew Joseph, Ryan McDonough, and Cal Foote would all be excellent picks in their own right, but I'm going to go with Yanni Gord. Gord centered the Lightning's shutdown third line that helped them outduel other stellar defensive teams like the Islanders and Canadians on the way to the Stanley Cup. Both of Gord's line mates, Barkley Goodrow and Blake Coleman, are pending free agents, so maybe the Kraken could reunite Gord with one of his line mates in Seattle. The reason my confidence factor is only a 5 for this pick is the number of other options Tampa has and the likelihood of a side deal. I still see a lot of side deal potential with the Lightning. While it wouldn't make sense for the Kraken to pick him outright in the expansion draft, I could definitely see the Lightning offering an asset in exchange for the Kraken taking Spokane native Tyler Johnson. His impressive playoff run this year may have convinced the Kraken that he could be worth bringing aboard despite his contract. Next from the Ottawa Senators, Chris Tierney. Tierney has been our pick here for a while, and that's because he fits as the kind of depth center the Kraken could use early on. I've mentioned in the past that I think Tierney was used in too defensive of a role this season, and could really bounce back if he was utilized more like he was in previous years in his career. Now, you may notice that A next to Tierney's name. For the first time on this projected roster, we're listing Tierney as an alternate captain. With Joe Pavelski no longer on this roster, we could use some leadership from our forwards, and I think Tierney could provide it. He has almost 500 NHL games under his belt, which is far and away the most among our forwards, and he was captain of his junior team, the London Knights, in the 2013-14 season, chosen as captain of the team ahead of even current Canucks captain, Bo Horvat. So I have no hesitation giving him a letter here. Next, we have Ryan Donato from the San Jose Sharks. The Sharks don't have a ton of great options exposed, and we've had Washington native Dylan Gambrell in this spot before, but I think Donato offers more upside with this pick. Donato is a skilled winger who's struggled to find a place in the lineup with both Minnesota and San Jose. He plays a skilled game, and his stick-handling prowess is evident in the shootout, where he's been a bit of a specialist, scoring on 46.7% of his career attempts. He had a career-low 5.8% shooting percentage last season, so it's fair to think that could rebound next year. As a low-risk, high-reward pick, the Kraken could give Donato one more shot to live up to the top six potential he's shown flashes of in his young career. Next from the Dallas Stars, Jason Dickinson. Until recently, Joe Pavelski was our projected pick from Dallas, but as we approach the expansion draft, it looks more and more like Pavelski will be protected. So that leaves us with Dickinson, who, while he doesn't bring as much on or off the ice as Pavelski, could be a good defensive center for a Kraken team that will need all the help it can get down the middle. While his scoring was nothing to write home about, this season, Dickinson emerged as one of the NHL's top defensive forwards, placing in the 96th percentile in defensive wins above replacement this season. You can bet the Kraken's analytics team has their eye on him after that kind of performance. Next from the Los Angeles Kings, Austin Wagner. If you've watched any of my previous projected roster videos, you've heard my take on Austin Wagner. He has elite, all-world speed, but just needs to work on his finishing and I really do think he has 20 goal scorer potential. Now, I've received a lot of pushback on that, and I get it. I can't prove it. And at this point, I just want the Kraken to take him so I can know whether I was right or wrong on this. And it looks like the Kraken, if they want him, he'll be available. After the Kings trade for Victor Arvidsson last week, Wagner is firmly on the outside of the Kings protection picture. Ron Francis, ball's in your court. Next is Nicholas Obey-Kubel from the Philadelphia Flyers. The Kraken will have plenty of good options to choose from in Philadelphia, and before anything else, Seattle has to make a decision of how much money they want to spend with this pick. 
You have three players in Van Riemsdyk, Voracek, and Gostisbehere who are on big contracts, but in the past have put up the production to justify their salaries. Adding to the temptation to take one of the big-name guys is the Kraken's hire of Dave Haxtell as their head coach. Haxtell got the best out of Voracek and Gostisbehere in his time as the Flyers coach, and it might be tempting to see if he could return one of those players to their peak level of play. But I think Ron Francis' overarching philosophy of prioritizing cap space and flexibility above all else is going to win out here, and that's why Obe Kubel is still the pick. While he's not a big name like the other three, Obe Kubel is an impressive player in his own right, and I've mentioned multiple times that I like what he brings to a team. He has a great motor, plays tough defensive assignments, and is a very mature player for his age. I don't think the Kraken will regret taking him over the others. Next from the Columbus Blue Jackets, we have Kevin Stenland. The Blue Jackets have had an incredibly rough year, and this offseason is certainly going to evolve a lot of change for the team. Looking at the protection list, it's easy to imagine it changing between now and the expansion draft. We know defenseman Seth Jones will be on the move this offseason, and Patrick Laine isn't guaranteed to stick around either. Because of that uncertainty, I've dropped my confidence factor for this pick from an 8 down to a 7. But in the Jackets' current state, Kevin Stenland stands out as the best exposed player. He's one of those players who's shown flashes of brilliance, but hasn't really been able to put it together consistently. And for that reason, the Kraken might be a good fit for him. They can give him a middle six center role and really get a feel for what his ultimate place is in the NHL. Next from the Pittsburgh Penguins, Zach Aston Reese. Aston Reese is a reliable defensive forward who the Penguins have trusted to take on some very difficult minutes on their fourth line. I think he'd fit in well with the group of forwards we have, who are very responsible in their own zone. Now, regarding the Penguins' expansion draft situation in general, looking at our protection list for Pittsburgh, I want to explain something that we've received some comments on from Penguins fans, asking why Brandon Tanev and Jeff Carter aren't listed here. Well, the reason is we don't project either of them to be protected in the expansion draft, and our exposed section here isn't a complete list of exposed players, but rather the players we think the Kraken have a realistic shot of taking. And I don't think that applies to either Carter or Tanev. In Carter's case, he's been reported to be picky about where he plays as he winds down his career, with rumors even saying he's threatened to retire if he was traded somewhere he didn't want to go. I've seen no indications that Carter has any desire to leave Pittsburgh, so I think the Kraken will leave that situation alone. As for Tanev, it's his contract. While I like what he brings on the ice, a cap hit of $3.5 million over the next four seasons for a bottom six player who will turn 30 next season is a complete non-starter for a Kraken team looking to have salary cap flexibility going forward. Next is Dominic Cahoon from the Edmonton Oilers. With the Oilers re-signing Ryan Nugent Hopkins to an 8-year extension, they are now guaranteed to choose the 7-3-1 protection option, which doesn't leave a whole lot of attractive options for the Kraken. Oscar Kleffbaum is too much of a risk as there are doubts about him ever playing hockey again, and for similar reasons to Brandon Tanev that I just mentioned, the Kraken will not want to touch that Zach Cassian contract. So that leaves us with Cahoon, who had an impressive first two seasons in the NHL, scoring 37 points in his rookie year and scoring at a 45-point pace in his second year. But with only 15 points this year, he's on the outside of the Oilers' protection picture. Now, you could make an argument that Cahoon's drop-off in production is a product of his team's maybe not believing in him enough. Cahoon has struggled to find a consistent home as he's played for four teams already in his three-year NHL career. Maybe playing an expanded role on the Kraken could be the opportunity Cahoon needs to get back to his previous form. Next from the Winnipeg Jets, we have Mason Appleton. Ever since the Jets re-signed Adam Lowry, solidifying their protection picture, this pick has been a no-brainer. Appleton is the exact kind of player the Kraken should be looking to target in the expansion draft. A young player who's excelled in a bottom six role, flashed a lot of skill, and just needs more playing time and more opportunity. My confidence factor on this pick is an 8.5, tied for the second highest on the roster, and really my only hesitation on the pick is that the Jets might make the Kraken an enticing side deal offer to take someone else. Next is Evgeny Svechnikov from the Detroit Red Wings, and my projection for this pick hasn't changed much, mostly because there are a lot of unproven players in Detroit for the Kraken to choose from, any one of whom could be the pick. 
Giovanni Smith, uh, Ernie, Hiroshi, Svechnikov, or Panic are all still potentially in play, which is why my confidence factor remains at 3.5. Of those players, though, I do like Svechnikov. He scored 8 points in 21 games this season, and we've heard from some Red Wings fans that they'd be disappointed to lose him, which seems like a sign that he'd be a good pick. Next from the New York Rangers, Julian Gauthier. Of all 30 teams, the Rangers have the least to offer the Kraken, and it's not particularly close. Every key player of note is either protected or exempt from the expansion draft. While Rangers fans have created a very funny lobbying campaign to get the Kraken to take Brett Howden, I'm going to stick with Julian Gauthier here. He's a former Ron Francis first-round draft pick in 2016, and maybe the Kraken GM still sees some potential in him. Next is Nathan Bastion from the New Jersey Devils. I've been excited about the Kraken's pick from the Devils since the start of the season because they have eight eligible forwards who are either 22 or 23 years old. And I figured the Kraken could just wait and see how the season shook out and which of those young forwards would be available to them. Well, that's exactly what happened, and it looks like Nathan Bastion is going to be that guy. He was a second round pick in 2016 and projects as a grinding winger with some occasional scoring ability who's shown he could be very effective in a bottom six role. At six foot four and 207 pounds, he brings some size on the forecheck and even has a little more room to further fill out his frame. Next is Rasmus Asplund from the Buffalo Sabres. The Sabres expansion draft situation is another one that could change dramatically in the coming week or so. It's well known that a pair of former second overall picks in Jack Eichel and Sam Reinhardt are on their way out of Buffalo, and the Sabres have some incentive to move at least one of them before the expansion draft. Looking at their protection list, they have seven forward protection spots, but a clear top eight forwards to protect. For now, Asplund is the odd man out, and the Kraken would happily take him if he's available, but it looks likely to me that the Sabres will free up a protection spot for him before the 17th, which is why I've dropped my confidence factor on this pick down to a 4. Next, we have Otto Koivula from the New York Islanders. Now, Koivula has been our projected pick from the Islanders ever since we launched this projected roster in March, and that's because the other options are big money veteran players. Josh Bailey and Nick Letty have cap hits of five and five and a half million dollars respectively, and with both players on the wrong side of 30, they don't really make much sense for Seattle. Koivula is still a project and will certainly require more time in the AHL before he's ready, but the 22-year-old forward is the best fit for what the Kraken are trying to build with this team. Next from our rivals to the north, we have Jonah Gadjevich. The Kraken are set to play their first ever preseason game against the Canucks less than three months from now on September 26th, which of course raises the question of which stolen player will suit up for the Kraken against his former team in that game. Now, while there are some forwards out there with maybe a higher floor like Zach McEwen or Matthew Highmore, and some Canucks fans are still holding out hope that the Kraken will take Braden Holtby off their hands, and uh, good luck with that. I think Jonah Gadjevich is the best pick here. Like with Koivula, this is a situation where I think the Kraken are better off taking a prospect who can develop in their system. And Gadjevich is an interesting prospect to have. He was a second round pick in 2017, and he's something of a pure goal scorer. Over his last two seasons with the AHL's Utica Comets, Gadjevich has 28 goals to just 7 assists. After watching some of his game film, he looks like a Tomas Holmstrom type of throwback player who makes a living in front of the opponent's net. I'd be interested to see if a player like that could thrive in today's NHL, and I think it'd be a good bet for the Kraken to make. Rounding out the forwards, we have Tanner Jeannot from the Nashville Predators. Last week, the Predators became the first team to start their pre-expansion draft off-season posturing when they traded forward Victor Arvidsson to the Los Angeles Kings. Preds GM David Poyle came out and said after the deal that if Arvidsson wasn't traded, he would have been the Kraken's pick in the expansion draft, and the Predators wanted to get something for Arvidsson rather than losing him for nothing. Trading Arvidsson is going to allow the Predators to adopt probably the most unusual protection configuration that we're going to see in this expansion draft. We are projecting Nashville to protect three forwards and five defensemen, which would make them most likely the only team to do so this year. 
given the defense-heavy protection choice from the Predators, it's going to make sense for the Kraken to take a forward. But which one? Nashville would no doubt like the Kraken to take one of Ryan Johansson or Matt Duchesne's contracts off their hands, but Ron Francis certainly isn't going to do that without some major assets going Seattle's way on top of the pick. Assuming there's no side deal struck between the teams, I think Jeannot would be the best pick here. All three players in Nashville's famed herd line of Jeannot, Colton Sissons, and Yakov Trenin are available here, and you could make a good case for any of the three. But I'm going with Jeannot. He's the youngest, cheapest, and has the most points per game. Moving on to the defense, and this is once again going to be the biggest area of strength for the Kraken. The top six, while lacking a truly elite defenseman, compares very favorably with other blue lines around the NHL. Now, I've talked about viewing this roster as a collection of assets, and that really applies here. Looking at the 10 defensemen we have here, nine of them should be NHL regulars right now, and of course, that's more than the six or maybe seven D spots the Kraken are going to have on opening night. So some of these defensemen are going to be used as trade assets to help improve the forward group, and we'll keep that in mind when running through our picks here. And we'll start with Mark Giordano who, despite being 37 years old, has been a workhorse again for the Flames, leading all Calgary skaters in ice time and all Flames defensemen in points this season. With Calgary having a trio of younger, cheaper defensemen to protect in Rasmus Anderson, Noah Hannafin, and Chris Tanev, Flames management may feel that it's the right time to move on from their longtime captain. The Kraken could keep Giordano as a veteran leader on the blue line, or trade him as some pundits have suggested. One rumored destination could be Edmonton. If the Oilers aren't able to close out a deal for Duncan Keith, they'd likely have a lot of interest in Giordano, who's been the more productive player recently and is on a better contract. Next from the Minnesota Wild, Matt Dumba. Looking at the Wild's protection list, we see that they have severely limited flexibility, with a league-high five no-move clauses forcing them to protect some players they probably otherwise wouldn't. As it stands right now, the Wild have to expose one of Matt Dumba or Jordan Greenway, either one of which would be a huge get for the Kraken. That said, I can't imagine that Wild GM Bill Guerin will stand by and do nothing before the expansion draft. It's been reported that the Wild are considering buying out Zach Parise, which would allow them to protect both Dumba and Greenway. Failing that, they could trade Dumba in the coming week and get a return like the Predators did with Arvidsson. That's why my confidence factor is only a 3.5 here. That said, there's still been no update on any moves the Wild might make, so until we hear reports otherwise, Dumba is exposed and therefore the pick here. Next is Nikita Zadorov from the Chicago Blackhawks. It seems like there's a growing consensus in Blackhawk circles that Riley Stillman will be the third defenseman protected by Chicago, leaving Zadorov exposed to the Kraken. While Zadorov could have some value as one of those defensemen that the Kraken flip, I wouldn't mind hanging on to him. In order to win the Stanley Cup, you need big defensemen who play a heavy style of game and can grind an opponent down over the course of a playoff series. Zadorov boasts a 6'6", 235-pound frame and isn't afraid to use it to strike a bit of fear into opposing forwards. As we just saw over the past two months, that becomes invaluable come playoff time. Next from the Colorado Avalanche, Ryan Graves. The Avs expansion draft situation, which seemed pretty clear-cut heading into the playoffs, now isn't so certain. Nazem Kadri again hurt his team by getting suspended for a headshot in the playoffs, and now he might look expendable to Colorado. The Avalanche could try to go the eight-skater protection route, exposing Kadri and Valeri Nichushkin to protect Graves. But I still think they'll view Kadri as too valuable to lose for nothing and go with the 7-3-1 option. Even if Colorado makes that decision, they could still move Graves in the next week. There would likely be a lot of demand for the 6-5, 220-pound blue liner if the Avs feel they need to move him to avoid losing such a valuable asset to the Kraken for nothing. While I still think Graves will be the pick, the uncertainty around the situation is enough for me to drop my confidence factor down to a 6. Next is Rodko Gudis from the Florida Panthers. I've mentioned in the past that I like what Gudis brings as a third-pairing defenseman. He's physical, plays with an edge, but is also an underrated puck mover. 
He could definitely be a candidate as one of those defensemen the Kraken flip in a post-expansion draft trade. But if the Kraken move on from Zadorov, I'd like to see them keep Gudis around because he brings a lot of the same physicality. I think Gudis would make a fine expansion draft pick, but it does appear as though the Kraken have more interest in Panthers goalie Chris Drieger. Since he's an upcoming free agent, I can't pick him here, but that's probably the direction the Kraken want to go with their pick from Florida, hence the low confidence factor. Now from the St. Louis Blues, we have Vince Dunn. The Blues have a lot of good options to choose from at both forward and defense. Sammy Blay, Oscar Sundqvist, Zach Sanford, and Nico Mikola would all be solid picks, but Vince Dunn stands out as the no-brainer pick here. This season, Dunn showed he belongs as a top-four defenseman in the NHL when he stepped up after St. Louis had significant injuries on defense. That said, Dunn's value is high enough that the Blues would be wise to move him before the expansion draft, and ultimately, I think there's a pretty good chance that that's what they'll do. That's why my confidence factor has dropped down to a 5 for this pick. Next from the Toronto Maple Leafs, Travis Dermott. With Zach Hyman looking to test free agency, the Leafs are all but assured to choose the 8-skater protection option. That leaves a pretty clear decision for the Kraken between center Alex Kerfoot and defenseman Travis Dermott. Of the two, I think Dermott provides better value. While Kerfoot has two years left at a $3.5 million cap hit that he doesn't always play up to, Dermott just signed a two-year contract extension at $1.5 million per, which is good value for what he brings as a third-pairing defenseman. And I have to say, I like how Dermott plays. He's a risk-taker defensively, often aggressively pressuring opponents with the puck and being eager to pinch in on plays. And, of course, that can lead to the unfortunate turnover here and there, as Leafs fans know all too well. But that aggressiveness prevents more breaks for opponents than it causes. And I think there are teams who understand that and value it. While the Kraken could hang on to him as a 6th or maybe 7th defenseman, I think with that contract, Dermott is a prime candidate for Seattle to trade post-expansion draft. Next, we have Jake Bean from the Carolina Hurricanes. Carolina has one of the most stacked blue lines in the NHL, and the Kraken are in position to take advantage. Jakob Slavin and Brett Pesci are locks to be protected, while the third protection spot is a toss-up between Brady Shea and Jake Bean. That means one of them is on track to be exposed, and I think it'll be Bean. I've mentioned in previous videos that Brady Shea is an underrated defenseman because he's not the flashy, offensive type. But I think the Canes organization's attitude towards Shea and Bean was demonstrated in the playoffs this year. Shea averaged 24 minutes of ice time per game, while Bean averaged just 14. That might give an indication of which one Carolina coach Rod Brindamore might like to have back most next season. That said, if you're the Kraken, you really can't go wrong. Both Shea and Bean would be fantastic options to add to a blue line. Now, there is a wild card in all of this, and that's Dougie Hamilton. Hamilton is a pending free agent and is easily the most sought-after UFA defenseman this year. If both sides are interested, the Kraken could sign him during their exclusive 48-hour negotiation window from July 18th to the 20th, but that would make him their expansion draft pick. It's believed the Kraken, particularly their analytics team, have a strong interest in Hamilton. But is that interest strong enough to forego selecting one of Bean or Shea to ensure that they get Hamilton before he hits the open market? We'll have to wait and see. Next from the Boston Bruins, Jeremy Lauzon. The Bruins' protection list has stayed pretty similar to how it was before the playoffs. The biggest question mark was a potential Taylor Hall extension, which doesn't look like it's coming before the expansion draft, so he probably won't be protected. Lauzon stood out as the best pick entering the playoffs, and I think he only helped his case in the Bruins' two-round playoff run. While he did have some rookie mistakes, like an ill-advised pass in overtime of Game 2 against the Islanders, watching him, I found myself thinking that he is going to be a playoff difference maker one day. He's not quite there yet, but he will be. When he was playing with confidence, Lauzon showed what he's capable of, and even showed some of that playoff nastiness I talked about with Zadorov and Gudis that makes a player all the more valuable as the stakes get higher. If the Kraken draft him here, I think they'd be wise to hang on to him. And finishing up the defenseman, we have Josh Mahura from the Anaheim Ducks. He's the lone defenseman on this roster who probably isn't ready to be an NHL regular next season, but that's okay. 
He's a talented puck mover who has a higher potential ceiling than some other options the Kraken would have from the Ducks, like Josh Manson or Kevin Shattenkirk. Finally, we move on to the goalies. And, oddly enough, they're back to the original three we had in March. Now, as we get closer to the expansion draft, it's worth keeping in mind that all three of these goalies are NHL ready. So if this is the way the goalie selections go, you'd have to think the Kraken would be looking to trade at least one of them for either futures or forward help, and that number could increase to two if they bring in Chris Drieger as well. Starting off the goalies, we have Jake Allen. It was a wild ride to the Stanley Cup final for Montreal, and it did change their expansion draft outlook in a couple ways. First, Jonathan Drouin is now firmly on the outside of the protection picture, while pending free agents Philip Dano and Yoel Armia greatly increased their value should the Kraken try to sign either of them in the exclusive negotiating window. Second, before the playoffs began, it looked like the Habs might try to steer the Kraken away from Jake Allen by offering them a draft pick, because they couldn't rely on Carey Price to be his usual self, and they needed a solid backup option in net. Well, Carey Price did his thing, and I don't think Montreal will be as averse to losing Allen anymore. Allen still makes sense for the Kraken as the veteran half of a goalie tandem, but now I wouldn't be surprised if they try to get a deal done with Dano or Armia instead, which is why my confidence factor has dropped on this pick. Next is Aiden Hill of the Arizona Coyotes. For the entire time I've been doing this projected roster, Hill has been the obvious pick from Arizona, and nothing has changed here. He finished the season with a 9-9-1 record and a 9-13 save percentage, which was good enough to earn him a spot on Team Canada for the World Championships, where they won a gold medal. Unless Arizona trades Darcy Kemper before the expansion draft, Hill will be the pick here. Finally, we have Vitek Vanacek from the Washington Capitals. With TJ Oshie all but assured to be protected, the Kraken's eyes turn to the net in Washington. The Capitals have two young, cheap, promising netminders, and thanks to the expansion draft rules, can only protect one. While Vanacek was their starting goalie this season, I think the Caps opt to protect Samsonov instead. He has a first-round draft pedigree and probably still has the higher ceiling of the two. The Kraken will happily swoop in and take Vonacek, who finished sixth in Calder Trophy voting for the top rookie in the NHL this year, and is signed to a bargain contract. So there it is. That's where our projected roster stands only 11 days before the expansion draft. While this is the final projected roster video I'll do, this is still a live updated roster, so check in often, especially with all the moves that are going to take place in the coming week. We'll be covering each and every one of those moves as they happen, and changes will be reflected in the roster on the website right away. And please continue to let us know what you think. Is there a pick you disagree with? Do you think picking a low salary team is the right strategy? What trades do you think will be made between now and the expansion draft? Let us know in the comments or reach out to us on any of our social media. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at EmeraldCityHKY, on Instagram, also EmeraldCityHKY, here on YouTube, Emerald City Hockey, and on the website, EmeraldCityHockey.com. Thanks everyone for watching and go Kraken!